Hello, everyone, and welcome to Critical Coaching for Success in the Classroom. I'm Penny Siavieri, and I'll be your host for the next powerful, right, Power Talk, 30 minutes, and we'll be joined uh, shortly by Jan Lutterbein, who will be taking us through some great strategies to make sure our classrooms are dialed in right from the beginning this academic year. Looks like we have some hellos to some of our PLC clients out there. So I'd like to shout out to Mexico. Thank you for joining in. We have from Western New York, Lackawanna. And from Long Island, looks like Hicksville and Hello Patchogue Medford. So a little bit of uh, context here. This is part of a series that's going to take place throughout the academic year. We have four three-part series. So we'll be doing 12 webinars throughout. And we want it to be really relevant information uh, pertinent to where we are in the academic year. So this series is all about starting out strong. Our next series will start at the end of November, and that will be a series entitled uh, Keeping on Track. So we hope you'll join. We'll give you that information uh, at the end of today. So it's my pleasure to introduce one of my colleagues for over 10 years and great friend, Jan Lutterbein. Jan and I originally worked together in Webster Central School District. She was the assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction, did a fabulous job there. And as a result of that strategic plan, Jen, if you remember, Webster was named to the DeFore list of great PLC schools nationally. So what a credit to you and to the district. So Jan, uh, to you, if you want to provide a little bit of introduction and I'll go through our slides. Sure. Um, so I work with some fabulous people at PLC. Um, I have great colleagues that I've worked with for about the past 11 years. And a lot of the work that you're going to see today comes from the work that we've done together, the discussions we've had together about what's essential to coach for success in, as leaders and as uh, teachers and in the classroom. So um, I, I'm very excited about spending some time talking to you about norms and success criteria. And I guess that's our, our first question here. We have teed up. Okay. So... Um, norms are, are really essential to anything that we do as leaders, as teachers, and in the classroom. And what norms are are really success criteria. They tell us exactly, they provide for us a clear description of what it looks like to successfully implement something, whether it is a classroom discussion, whether it is the implementation of some professional learning um, initiative, or whether it is about what it really takes to be an effective teacher and a change agent in a classroom. So norms or success criteria are really essential to all we do. You're gonna see in front of you um, a list of six norms. And my colleagues and I, um, Tamara Lipke, Cindy Rice and I have gotten together and what we've talked about, and we've written an article and Tamara will put that article in the, in the, um, the chat box in a minute, but what we've talked about a lot is what are those elements or attributes that must be in place for successful learning to stick? And this is for you as a teacher or for you as a leader to think about a little bit as I go through these and reflect on what is my as is statement, my as is position as I kick off this year. So the first one is, do you, does a leader have a clear vision of what professional learning should look like in the district? And is it communicated and shared with the leadership team? To build on that a little bit is, is the vision clear? Is it shared? Is it communicated regularly? Is it celebrated when we see successes? Do we see the leaders celebrating the successes and sharing improvements? And most of all, to get that clear vision, is that, t is that leader in those professional learning sessions? So this is one of the attributes of a strong um, success criteria for the implementation of strong professional development. Um, are the identified instructional priorities aligned with the vision? Are we doing what we say we're gonna do? Are the professional learning structures and planning time in place? Do teachers know about them? Are they are, are, are teachers aware of when they'll be where they're supposed to be? That communication link is so, so important. Are leaders and teachers clear about their roles? Do leaders and teachers have the same vision and is it shared? And do we talk about it all the time? And is there a culture of learning and continuous improvement? Tamara and Cindy and I wrote an article that was in professional um, leadership 
And what you will see here is an explanation of these six principles and why this success criteria is so important if you want professional learning to stick. So Penny, you know, let's talk a little bit about these principles as we think about districts a little bit. You know, from, from your perspective, um, which of these principles do you think, Penny, are, are things that you have seen um, in districts that really matter? And Janda, as we're thinking about all of this, we take a look at how much time, right? Time, energy goes into professional learning. And I think one of the, the great questions to ask is, do we see a return on our time and resources investment? And one of the greatest things that's happening, we see with all of our schools and talented associates who are working in our schools, the impact is there. So as a result of really relevant um pertinent professional learning, and Jan will talk about in a learning by doing kind of format, we're so glad to see that the professional learning sticks and then subsequently is having an impact on our learners. That should be the standard. It should be, and it, it isn't always. And so in those districts that are most successful, we see that leader out there sharing that vision all the time. We see that leader in our professional learning sessions and, and becoming knowledgeable and really understanding that instructional practice. We see great communication. So these, as you sit here as a leader, I want you to think a little bit about, are these five things in place in your district? And if they aren't, what steps might you take? So these are norms and success criteria for great opportunities for professional learning to stick and our investment to pay off. And also, you know, having this information available, we're hoping that you take this back to your team meetings, take it to your leadership team next strategy session and do some reflection and take a look at, you know, individually, am I promoting these kinds of things? And collectively, because we know collective efficacy again, right from Hattie is so critical. Do we as an intact leadership team represent this and communicate this on a continual basis. And just one more piece around this. So um, my colleagues and I have created a rubric that we think is essential in initial discussions with new districts. So we'll be sharing that with you at some point soon. Um, if we think about success criteria for teachers, um, Hattie's work is just, just so essential in, in really thinking about the way teachers think about their roles. Um, Hattie identifies eight mind frames, and he has 10 now, but I, I, we're doing the, the first eight. He identifies eight mind frames that teachers need to have as if we want professional learning to stick, if we want professional learning to really make the changes and impact on students that we want them to happen. If we go to the next slide, let's take a look at a couple of those um, that I think are critical for us to talk about. Um, think about the shift here, the shift in how in teacher thinking. This success criteria, this list of eight helps us see what, it gives us a clear description of what successful implementation professional learning looks like if we can get teachers to make this shift. Take a look at number one. My fundamental task is to evaluate the effect of my teaching. Um, too often we think about inputs and not outputs, right? But if we begin to think like an assessor, um, there's an old, old quote that says, I taught it, but they didn't learn it. So if we can make that shift to thinking about the effect of my teaching versus what I did, that changes the whole dynamic of how we teach, what we teach, and what we do. Um, I love this. So the first, second, third, and fourth really are about impact. Look at the second one. The success and failure of my students' learning is about what I do and don't do. Too often we hear... Um, my students aren't in attendance. Of course, that's important, but my students didn't do this. They didn't do their homework. They're not motivated. That switch in success criteria to thinking about, it's about what I did and evaluating my practice and how do I make it different for, for kids? Um, number three, I want to talk more about learning the teaching and assessment is about my impact. That is an enormous shift in how mm -hmm. teachers think about their practice. I love number five. Um, number five is at the core of the work that we have done um, in the foundational five. I teach through dialogue, not monologue. I teach through the notion that 
my students are engaged and invested and a part of, of what we're doing, everything that we're doing. Um, so much of our work around protocols is based on this notion of all voices need to be heard and not a few. Um, I love six. I enjoy the challenge versus I am just trying to do my best. And look at seven. It's my role to develop relationships. It is quite a shift, isn't it, in how we think about um, the role of a teacher in a, in a building and in a classroom. It's mm -hmm. the same for a principal. It's my role to develop relationships in class and staff rooms. And I inform all about the language of teaching. I spent 27 years at West Aranda Clay High School. And um, if you're in a faculty room, you probably would hear people talking about teaching. They were taught, they would talk about kids. We'd talk about the fun things we did. We'd talk about all kinds of things. But what you'd really hear a lot about is how did you do this? And what can I share with you? And that is a shift, a big shift in what makes some districts more successful. So as you look at this, these mind frames, Hattie's mind frames, this is not about judging teachers. This is about having great conversations about how do we make this shift. Another set of success criteria. And you know, just taking a look at this and maybe pulling out what you were saying, Jan, number five here, dialogue, not just monologue. It's really interesting when we move away from rather Te just exclusively almost teacher to student and then maybe minimal student to teacher, but we engage in dialogue. So that involves the entire classroom. Cognition changes and your level of thinking, you know, escalates as students when we have to engage with other students, listen to what they're saying, integrate that into our learning. And you're doing this entire almost synthesis of the information that's offered at the classroom level. That is so powerful. And that really is consistent with how our world operates, right? As we leave school and go off to our careers and, uh, you know, pursue our, our dreams, it's contingent upon us to be able to pull together all available information, make meaning of it, make sense of it, and then construct our thoughtful kind of response. So I really like the fact that all of our associates now and working with our schools are really talking about the, the power of dialogue and discussion. And let's explore that a little bit more with the next slide. You know, Penny, when you asked me to do this, you asked me to pick out what are those most important things, those most important practices that I want all administrators and leaders to think about as we as we move into the school year, more deeply into the school year. Um, the notion of more dialogic, less monologic is critical. Um, when we talk about high impact practices for the classroom, classroom discussion has an effect size of 0.82. If 0.4 on Hattie's barometer gets you one year of growth for students, 0.82 class discussion is extremely powerful. We're looking at two years growth within a year. And this is some of the data from Hattie that really supports why we need to make that change. This was a frightening number for me. Teachers talk between 70 to 80% of the time on average during a lesson. And teacher talk increases as we go up the chain to high school, to middle school and to high school. Across the grades where instruction was challenging, relevant and academically demanding, students had higher engagement and teachers talked less. It is, you know, we, we talk about putting the student in the driver's seat. Um, we talk about who's doing the thinking in a classroom. And this data really tells us that it is still about the teacher doing the, the thinking and the teacher doing um, the talking. Look at the fourth bullet. Less than 5% of class time is devoted to group discussion. Now there may be, the teachers ask hundreds of questions a day. In, in, a, in a particular classroom, you could ask you know, 50 or 60 questions within that, at that particular lesson. But most of those questions are checking for understanding questions. Did you get this? Did you understand that? Some are procedural questions, but less than 5% of those questions are about how do I engage kids in discussion? How do I move from that monologic teacher asks a question, student responds, and teacher gives uh, their take on that to a classroom where all kids are engaged? And we spend so much time in our engagement um, portion of the foundational five to teach these protocols. 
look at the last bullet, about five to 10% of teacher talk triggers more conversation. Mm -hmm. I, you know, these, these pieces, these heady mind frames and this data is not to say that teachers aren't doing great things. And Hattie does not, that does not, he believes that teachers are doing great things. This is about how do we really use the research and the data to move and shift practice. Those mind frames would be great conversations for your faculty meeting. This data used gently, but, but clearly will be great fodder for some thought about how do we make this change? And you know, so, I think that that's, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. There's just so much here. It's hard not to just jump right in, right? Great advice for using this at a faculty meeting to really stir up discussion. That last line, you know, with the arrow here, deserves a resounding repeat. Teach teachers protocols. There are so many protocols out there and the engagement strategies support our teachers in that. You know, as leaders, know what you're looking for when you see protocols in use at the classroom level. And then let's, hello, Fullen, right? Co-accountability, hold everyone, ourselves and everyone in the, in the school accountable for these practices. I remember, and I have to credit one of our uh, team members, Carolyn Tinsley Trammell, when she was sharing at one of our strategy sessions about the school-wide five, thought that was incredible. So of all the protocols that were instructed as we were on site in this particular district, the school selected, each school selected five that they thought were really, really important and relevant for their students. Classroom instruction changed dramatically and the district then protected, you know, as part of the goals and part of the ways that we operate, each school will have their school-wide five. And additionally, the district selected the five as a district that we would like to have common across all schools. So that's a great example of changing a habit of practice that really impacts the classroom level. To add to that a little bit, Penny, um, you know, we've been at this a long time and we're not adding up the years or sharing those years, but we've been at this a long time and we know that there are three critical things to making professional learning stick. One is high quality professional development, teach the protocols, help teachers develop a toolkit so that they have something to go to, but then support them. And that means sometimes it means a principal or an instructional coach is in their modeling, is in their providing feedback, um, support them in terms of their ability to use them, and then hold them accountable. Without those three things, strong professional development, support, and accountability, professional development doesn't stick and teaching doesn't change. So Penny asked me to talk about high impact practices. The first high impact practice we talked about is discussion. All voices need to be heard. And the second high impact practice is establishing success criteria. Um, in our practice, we've used a lot of Hattie's work around creating an assessment capable learner. And you can see that the effect size of this is one of the highest effect sizes of anything that we can do. And here's our old friend, we need clear learning targets. I need to know where I'm going. But Hattie will tell you a learning target is not enough. Mm -hmm. You have to have the success criteria with it to show the pathway, the clear direction and how to get there. And when we put that success criteria in place along with the learning target, the effect size begins to just soar. The effect size of success criteria is 0.88 two years bang for buck, right? In addition to finishing that assessment capable learner, reflection and self-assessment and feedback, they all combine to create a student who owns their own learning. But lately, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about success criteria, not only in the classroom, but you know the ones we shared for leaders, the ones we shared for teachers and now in the classroom. And I wanna do an activity with you. So would you take out a piece of paper, please, and a pencil? And would you go to the next slide for me, please? <clears throat> Your task is to draw a house. And I'm gonna give you about a minute and a half to draw a house. And I want you to draw a really nice house. And I also want you to think about using this activity with your faculty. So draw a house. Um, all the things that go in houses, around houses, put them in, please.
And folks, as we're going through this, if you happen to have a question you'd like to drop in the chat box, please do. We have some time at the end for Q&A, some questions that we've um, decided to pose to Jan with her amazing expertise and things that you might want to ask. And so this activity will just take a, a few minutes, but it will show you clearly something that's very important for everyone to understand. So you're drawing a house. I'm going to give you 30 more seconds. Make that house wonderful. Put some nice stuff in it. You know, this is your house. And if we were all, if we could see you all, we'd hold up these houses so that we could all revel in the beauty of the houses that you're drawing. Okay, you got a house, right? Now let's grade that house. So Penny, go to the next slide. If you drew a chimney on that house, give yourself 30 points. If you drew a door, give yourself 20 points. And if you have two doors, give yourself, you know, 40 points or more. If you drew a doorknob or multiple doorknobs, 10. And if you drew a window, give yourself five points each. Now in the chat box, would you just please tell us how many points you have? Just somebody quickly, just tell us how many points you have in the chat box. Ooh, look wow. at that, 95, nice. Tell me more, what else do you have? 80, good job, Heather, but not quite 90. Oh, look at that, Heather has 100. Heather. Nice job, nice job. Give us a couple more. Oh, Christina. Uh. Yeah, sorry, but you know, there's, there's, there's hope here. So you, you do this activity and you kind of ham it up a little bit and you give people, you puff people up and you make them feel pretty proud, right? Now, would you go to the next slide, please? So if you drew a sun, take away 20 points. <laughs> Added a dog. I love that. We love that. Thank you, Veronica. If you drew a sun, take away 20 points. If you drew grass, take away 20 points. If you drew clouds, take away 10 points. If you put a dog in there, take away 50 points. How are you feeling now reading about your me. score? Yeah. How are you feeling now about your score? Right? This activity shows you, usually what happens is people get mad at me and, the, and they'll say, well, wait a minute, you didn't tell us. Wait a minute, I, I didn't know. Come on, I didn't know. If you would have told me up front, and that's just the point, isn't it? If we don't have success criteria in the classroom for the tasks we do, if we don't have success criteria for the for mind frames of what we want teachers to be, if we don't have success criteria, at the leadership level, then we don't have a clear pathway to success. And so success criteria for me has really become more and more important. And that's one of the reasons we're writing two rubrics. One, for partnership conditions that I showed you at the beginning. And two, for the implementation of the foundational five. So it's clear to school districts and to teachers and to students and to us where we are on that pathway of successful mm -hmm. implementation. So I'm sure that your scores change. Anybody want to put in the chat box a couple scores that how how they change? Come on, brave people. Oh, you're right, Jan. They're mad at you. Yep, they are. Heather went down from 100 to 80. Ah, Veronica 40. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. But we love the honesty. Right. Yeah, that's that's part of the action, being able to say, you know, I, I got it. Congratulations, self. Or, you know, Carol Dweck, I guess I'm just not there yet. Right. But do this activity with your faculty, because what it will do is help them to understand why norms matter in a classroom, because that's success criteria. Why giving assignments, when we give assignments, we need to use models. We need to use checklists. We need to let kids know up front. I love this, this quote by Ron Berger. If you're not getting the work, the quality of work you want, it is probably because kids have not seen a good model of that work. Success criteria gives us the clear description of what success looks like in a project or in a, in a particular assignment. So today's work for us today has been around thinking about what success criteria looks like for leaders, for teachers, and for kids. And Jan, I'm thinking, you know, through an analogy here and for all of our, our listeners, listeners and learners, right? Um, 
This applies at the school level. So think about that. We have school-based plans. Hopefully everyone has a school-based plan with very explicit goals and targets and strategies that we're going to implement over the course of the academic year. One of the things that we've asked our PLC team to do this year with our schools is identify three to five outcomes for year-end must-haves as a result of our work together. And really what this does like the classroom situation that Jan is explaining so well, it sets up success criteria for the school. So we can monitor ourselves all the way through our, to what extent are we on track? And I think, you know, that becomes another powerful force and also connects back to what Jan said earlier. Remember, um, as teachers, our responsibility, obviously being fantastic in the classroom, but we also have that shared responsibility of helping to move the school in the positive direction that we've outlined. So terrific. We have about five minutes left and Jan, we had some additional questions that people wanted to uh, ask and I'm watching the chat box now for any additional. So the first one, I know you've worked in hundreds of schools. Could you give us maybe an example or two of how classrooms have improved, maybe not necessarily naming the, the school or the district, but how classrooms have improved as a result of one of the habits of practice that you put into place. Um, I have learning targets tattooed on my arms, right? Um, the work around learning targets and the work around engagement protocols have had the most impact on, on the work that I have done in schools. And high schools are a little, little harder to get at this, but when I watch elementary schools begin to implement learning targets and middle schools begin to implement learning targets, I see such change. I see a change in student ownership of learning. I see a change in students really having voice and some control, some self-regulation around where they're going and what they're doing. And then the second piece is when you teach teachers protocols and they begin to use them, they're skeptical at first sometimes. I don't have time for this. But when they see the joy of kids participating in these protocols because they can talk, they can share ideas, they can learn from each other. And those are all things we know from Hattie that have a great impact on transferability and retention. And what about, maybe we'll skip down to number three, um, teacher-led learning walks. That's something that we're instituting, again, with the schools that we work with. So powerful. I know sometimes historically, we educators have not been terrific around come visit my classroom, but the, the power of what happens if we take professional learning, you know, out of the workshop setting and then cascade it into the entire school through the brilliance of teachers, you know, supporting and watching teachers and folks volunteering to see what my neighbor next door is doing. Just tell us a little bit about those learning walks. You know, so what we built into our, our cycles and people who are in your audience know this because we've done this in, in their districts is we start with high quality professional development, helping people get the information and the tools and the ideas. And then we move to let's have a consultant do some learning walks and give people feedback. But then as we move on, it becomes so important to have teacher led learning walks or demonstration classrooms where teachers can go into each other's classroom. And setting this up is is a um, is a build some trust. We need to build some trust in order to do that. And so we set it up very carefully. It's not evaluative. Um, we use tools that just ask for what are what are we noticing? What are we wondering? What are some wows? So that we can give teachers feedback because during this session, teachers want feedback. They want to know what their colleagues think. But in the end, probably teacher led learning walks are one of the most powerful ways in which we change practice in a district. And um, it, they surprisingly change even the most reluctant teacher because they get to see their colleagues implementing those things that they've learned with their kids. And that matters to them. In my building with my kids, does this work? And teacher led learning walks make that happen. So if you haven't started teach led learning walks, please start them. And if you need help and support over your crew for uh, launching this in your school. Um, so, I guess we'll stop right there. We'll have to wait for another power talk to hear your brilliance around what school leader walkthrough should look like. Jan, I have to thank you. It's it's 
wonderful information. And I like the fact that all this content is usable information we can take right from this webinar back to our school, into our teams, faculty meetings, leadership team meetings, grade level content area meetings, and use it, you know, to go on to our next level. So our next session is October 12th. This is part of our Start Starting School Strong this year series. And we'll hear from Emily Rothell, another one of our talented associates here at PLC. And this will be all about, well, success criteria at the school level. And as we march through the cadence of, you know, September, October, November, all the way to the end, what kinds of things should we be looking for and paying attention to as we status check and hold ourselves accountable for the great things that we'd like to accomplish. So please make sure, uh, of course, you join in. And with that, Jan Lutterbein, I thank you so much. It was wonderful as always. I always learn something new each time and I just appreciate you for that. And to our listeners and leaders and learners out there, thank you for sharing time with us uh, today and um, allowing us to enter into your um, school environment and share a little bit of information and insight. We appreciate you. Thank you all. Thank you.